You're back at sea. Since your arrival in Zanzibar, you haven't had a moment's peace. Always been moved from place to place. Nonetheless, Helen's image still engraved in your mind. The grief of her loss has torn up your inside. They're torn you up inside. You hear her voice echoing in your head. She calls your name requesting your aid. Jake. Jake. But the horrors of your past still haven't left you yet. Not even on the other side of the world. Oh, and uh, let's see. If you see, like, issues with sentences like this, because there's the grief of her loss, I just torn you up in sides. Yeah, it's because this isn't... I guess the people that made this game aren't natively English. So it's a localization. So there's just going to be a few issues like that. But don't worry about it. For the most part, it's good. Lost in your thoughts, you didn't notice the vessel you are on. Which is much smaller than the ship that brought you to Zanzibar. And just big enough to contain your squadron. Has reached the docking point of a seemingly abandoned village. You do not know what to expect yet, but the idea of dealing with this disease that Captain Smith was talking about puts you on edge. You quickly disembark from the vessel and get in line. Smith examines you, then orders to search the village. You walk around the hut slowly and watchfully, as if you expect an attack at any moment. Despite the village appearing completely abandoned, you examine some dwellings and it feels like you are in a horror story. Some beds are still warm. There's still food and water on the table, and abandoned wooden toys and utensils give the impression of recent life. It looks like the people suddenly vanished, disappeared in a blink of an eye. Then you hear something. A sizzle in the air, an unidentifiable smell, mixed with the one of the extinguished embers. You look and see smoke coming from behind a hut. Your heart jumps up into your throat. Maybe someone is still around here. You move closer quickly. You can't see in the anguish the spooky village gives you any longer. You go around the hut and right in front of you. There's the answer to all your questions. The stink is unbearable. It forces you to cover your nose with your hand. Flies do their grisly dance around the carbonized corpses. Flitting here and there like loose cannons. You stare at the body stunned. Their flesh is covered by the remains of a bonfire. Muscle exposed to the... Sparkling red embers. Their carved up expressions swallowed by ashes. It is a pile of death, black smoke, and buzzing bugs. Behind you, hear someone approaching a quick pace. You recognize the unmistakable sound, and you turn to meet Captain Smith's look. He's clearly worried, although he tries to hide from himself and the rest of the true. All the men gaze at the bonfire. Well, a blanket of silence falls upon you. Observe. Or medical. We need an observation check. Okay. Said I want to wait. Get speech craft. I think this is important. So let's get the observation check. You move closer to the corpse to have better luck. Success. You move close to the corpses slowly, with some reticence. Despite the pile, you manage to look at some of the pro some of them properly, and you don't find any visible wounds. You don't know how they died based only on mere observation, but this could be the disease. Is this what Smith was talking about? That's not a good sign. As far as we know, this village should have been outside the contaminated area. The captain's initial hesitation betrays his concern. Smith pulls out a map from his backpack, and having searched it for a few moments, and shows it to you. 
He points to three small villages near the rebel camp. We are near the German border. Good to proceed carefully. There might be enemy soldiers in this area. You are deciding which village to explore first. When a noise emanating from a hunt's hut startles you, making you turn instantly with your rifles ready to shoot. Walking slowly and with a terrified expression, the man moves closer with his hands up in the air. Stop! I am friend! My name is Batsarai. I help. The man watches you with anxiety, still terrified of being riddled with your bullets. The glance moves frantically from one to another. Then it stops on you. Smith gestures to lower the rifles. Then he steps up, addressing Betsarai. Who did this? Betsarai moves his eyes away from you, like you woke up from some kind of trance, and follows Smith's gaze to the pile of charred corpses. Food? First I eat, then I help. Smith snorts annoyed. Give him something to eat. He comes with us. He could be useful. But Sarai doesn't stop smiling. While Ryan gives him a food ration for his personal provisions. Smith's eyes go back to the map. While he slowly moves closer to you, he passes the map to you. What do you think, Huntington? Where should we start from? It's clear Smith entirely relies on your judgment. Your role in this mission is of primary importance. What? Way too much responsibility. Alright. North Village, South. Well, we're probably out here. I feel like the South. As you enter the village, you're plunged into an eerie silence. You have a deja vu reliving a memory that has come to knock at the door of your reality. It's exactly like the first handful of huts when you came ashore. Empty homes and signs of life that were extinguished in the blink of an eye. Smith gestures at you to split up and investigate, while the voice of anguish grips your hearts once again. Suddenly you hear a noise coming from the bushes around you. The murmur of foliage disturbed by motion. Branches rustling. The play of sunlight on the leaves turning into a dangerous glare. You whirl around, your heart missing a beat. Then you catch a glimpse of a shadow flitting from branch to branch. You ex exhale in relief. It was just a bird. You dance deep into the forest, branches twisting away from the trees as if trying to escape the hold of the trunk. As though they were trapped in their consorted effort or attempt at escaping. Drawing disquieting shadows in the daylight that they are slicing through with their crooked fingers. You can almost hear them screaming. No, you're really hearing a voice. Someone is actually screaming in the main village. It's Betsurari. Let's go back. I'm not going to leave anyone to die. Nope. You run, moving the branches away from your face. And those you miss scratch you as if trying to hold you there to share their pain. When you get to the interpreter, he is in shock. He is upset, babbling his eyes wide, gesturing frantically at the forest. Devil. Devil. You cannot understand what he means. Question. Ah, speechcraft. You try to calm down Beth Sarai, putting your hands on his shoulders, looking him straight in the eyes. You let him vent and talking to talk to you, replying to him in a calm and steady voice. You ask him to explain more clearly who that devil was. White man, naked, red eyes, cries blood, wants to kill. You wonder what he could have seen, or whether his words are implausible. Or an accurate description of the truth. Could he really have seen a white man seemingly possessed? You don't get a question further. A figure suddenly appears out of nowhere and attacks you. 
It's a fair-skinned man shouting incoherent words. In an instant, he throws you to the ground, wraps his hands around your neck. Your vision grows dim. Small flashes seem to lure you to unconsciousness. Your pupils filling with wisps. You know you're about to lose consciousness as you struggle to breathe. His bloodshot eyes and the crippling madness are fixed on you. The man gnashes his teeth like an animal. It's hard enough to hear it. Do we... Elbow him? We can't win fighting. So help. Do you desperately struggle to rip free from his hold? Do you lack the strength to successfully pose your foe? Do your foe? Do you try to scream and the man reacts by tightening his grip on your neck? Do your cries die in a choked rasp? And the reality surrounding you starts to fade away. Fogged up and liquid. You're about to freeze. The about to freeze. About to lose consciousness again. Suddenly your enemy freezes. Caught suddenly by the spoochie's bayonet. Now piercing his body from behind. Right through his spine. Blood drips in madman's mouth. And he stares at you wild eyed. One last breath were crumbling upon you. Lifeless. Abandoned in Vespucci. Help me push the, push the man's body off of you. Dropping it aside. Your uniform is utterly drenched with his blood. And for the moment, the exhaustion and the almost feigning strike you. Almost feigning strike of vague nausea. You press it, often grasp the hand the Irishman has extended to help you get back on your feet. Thanks. You catch your breath. Eyeing internal Bannon and mostly the Spoochy. Without his intervention, you would have surely died under the man man's bad man's iron chokehold. Don't mention it, mate. Just doing my duty. More to the point, though, what the devil got into him? A devil indeed, huh, Doc? A man tries to diffuse the tension. Do you proceed to examine the victim's body? And after a few minutes of analysis, ready to give your diagnosis. You explain to your comrades the, that you believe the case is a fever, most likely of the malaric type. The only thing that doesn't make sense are the wounds. Are those wounds utterly foreign to malaria, or indeed any known disease? On the man's body, you observe lesions, small bleeding sores. You turn the stranger's corpse on its front. And you inspect his back and neck. There you discover more of these wounds, marring his skin. Blood continuously flowing through them. On the nape of his neck, you see something unusual. They look like bug bites, but they're symmetrical as if they were left there deliberately. In a precise order. They remind you of a diamond with a circle within. Nothing could be less natural than this. In the meantime, Smith, Betsarai, and the other men from the squadron have joined you. The interpreter is still shaken by his previous experience and keeps his distance from the German. While Smith turns to you with a cross expression. We found the surviving villagers. The disease has spread to this place too. They say that the white man belongs to a larger group who abandoned Cam here some days ago. You're troubled. This expedition is turning into an endless nightmare. Too many questions crowd your mind at the moment. For a start, what was that man doing in the village? Was it happenstance? Or did somebody perhaps set the situation up deliberately? Interesting. Okay. So we got a journal entry and got some experience. We're up to nearly 20 again. Yeah, I don't care about that. Alright. Yeah. yeah. Okay, doesn't seem to be anything. Nothing important. Alright, let's do one more village. Well, we're headed south. Why not go 
west. Upon entering the village, you immediately feel an embracing atmosphere. Smith is relieved when he sees men and women wing peacefully among the huts. Two of them approach you. It's a shaman with his daughter. Do you speak our language? The girl smiles. She answers affirmatively. Says she often deals with the British. You have decided to call her Lorraine for ease. If you need to rest, you can stay here for the night. Smith looks at his troops' men. After a moment, he nods, accepting the offer. Some rest will be good for you. When evening falls, men have organized themselves for the night. A big bonfire is lit in the middle of the village. O'Bannon sings a song, pulls out a bottle of whiskey, sharing it with the others. Ryan's dinner refreshed you, then you can finally enjoy a moment of quietness. Sean moves closer and asks Smith to follow him. He wants him to go to his hut. Captain watches the man with a grim look on his face, and with the bonfire's flames reflected in his glasses lenses. Then he stands without saying a single word and follows the shaman to a hut that is bigger than the rest. You notice the Lorraine in contrast is moving away from the village. Wait for a return to follow her. I'm not gonna just stay and stick around. I wonder if this is some observation. What is she up to? The girl goes deep into the greenery. In the starlight, you see her looking for some herbs, choosing and picking some of them up from the ground, then put them into a straw basket. Ask her? To observe. We got observation. You try to understand which kind of herb the rain is gathered in her basket, but you're too far away and it's too dark to even guess. Try to get close to being a herd, but you step on a branch making the girl jolt. I am sorry, it's me, Jake. The rain relaxes, smiles, starts to explain she's looking for some particular herbs. She needs them to prepare a concoction to protect the villagers. Her words definitely intrigue you. Is this concoction connected to the disease? I think I'll wait. Let her. But say her piece first. Thorin hesitates for a few seconds. Then she starts to open up, starts talking about a mysterious disease. Some weeks earlier, a sick man arrived to the village, hallucinating and delusional. Believing he had been afflicted by some kind of curse, Thorin gave him the medicine, hoping to defeat the evil that was distressing the man. Within a couple of hours, the man calmed down. The sores healed within one night. The concoction saved both his body and mind, although he remembers almost nothing about his journey before arriving in the village. <sighs> Since then, the rumors of his disease have been frequently heard. Although none of the villagers have become sick, the rain prepares the concoction for each man, woman, and child in the village, day after day. It has become her role. Protect the disease Protect so the protect the village so the disease never touches her loved ones or family or community. Why are you doing this and not your father? Isn't he the shaman? Shroud of sadness passed over the girl's eyes. Because he won't be shaman forever, then ought to take his place. And he says the time says that time will soon come. You realize you've touched a very sensitive topic. And you simply put your hand on her shoulder to comfort her. Lorraine looks you right in the eye, so she's attempting to locate something deep inside of you. People dilated as a result of who knows which emotions. You experience a thrill. How long has it been since one looked at you like that? You deal with diseases too, right? You nod and you can't stop staring at her. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, I better get a choice in this. We are on a mission. We must focus. Sounds of the night gather around you. Lorraine seems closer and closer, and somehow, you know it's you who has moved towards her. I was a doctor before joining the army. 
The range hesitates for a moment, for an instant, then she smiles and turns. She keeps getting needed herbs for the concoction. Let me see how you prepare the concoction. Okay. Okay, hopefully this is not going the way I expect. I don't want that to happen. The rain gestures for you to follow her, bring you to her hut. She sets a little fly into clay bowls, showing her to prepare the concoction. You watch each of her movements while she mixes what's left of the plant with some liquids, boiling it and then filter the mixture multiple times. The concoction is ready. With the approval of Lorraine, you pour some of the concoction into a vial, storing with great care, slipping it inside your backpack, and then you drink a spoonful. You leave the hut and join your comrades around the fire. You join a man's new drinking round. He already seems too drunk to understand it's time to stop. Soon enough his whiskey gets you all fairly drunk, and you find yourself staring at the swaying heads of your comrades. Irishman seems unstoppable, and he continues singing cheerfully. Just as Lorraine approaches each of you with a big clay bowl. Seems to contain the concoction she prepared to offer to you, squadron members. Lost in the effects of the alcohol, you all accept the offer to drink the mysterious liquid. Uh oh. I don't like the way they described that. Lost in the effects of alcohol and are drinking mysterious liquid. Gulp. You keep drinking and take away the awful taste of the concoction you just swallowed. The world around you starts to cloud. Colors slowly blur, starting to light it more and more. While the shapes of the objects, your comrades melt into weird, incomprehen incomprehensible fractals. You don't know if it's whether it's O'Bannon's whiskey or Lorraine's pungent mixture, but at some point you don't know whether you're awake or already dreaming. The rain walks up to you with her light steps. Jake, come with me. I want to show you one more thing about her medicine. Uh. Uh oh. Please, no, let me choose. The rain takes her head softly, you feel a thrill. Uh, no. Sorry! We're drunk? We got some drugs in our head. No, we got a mission. Do not follow. Period. No, you can show me tomorrow morning. Now I'd like to finish this evening with my comrades. As you wish, Jake. The rain looks at you, trying to hide some embarrassment and then a little disappointment. Then she quickly says goodbye. Yeah, aha. Uh -huh. We know. We know the plans. Both of you. I'm not gonna let you or my character ruin this mission. Not a good idea. We got a deadly disease to investigate. A band raises this bottle with joyful enthusiasm and gives it to you. You take another sip of it. You need to stay with your comrades, because you don't know what to expect in the coming days, and strange seas bothers you a lot. You wonder when you could have another chance with her. Oh my gosh. Focus. Achievement failed. You know, that's fine. We want to stay alive. That's what matters. It's only at 22 still. You slept in the camp, in the open air. When you woke up, the first thing that welcomed you was a violent and painful headache. Gee, I wonder why. You stagger, grumbling, incoherently muttering, and stretching. The rest of the troop is already having breakfast. You see the bottles of whiskey scattered on the ground. You don't remember much about what happened last night. You join the men. Start eating too. You're talking to Ryan while you eat some delicious bacon prepared by the Italian. When Smith approaches, it's time to go. The men get ready, the captain talks to you. Did you find anything out about the disease? 
The rain gave a concoction which may hinder the effects of the disease or even heal an affected person, but it needs to be tested to make sure it works. Some good news, finally. I made us talk to the shaman, and he told me some men in tunics across the border. Everyone in the nearby villages is talking about it. They may be involved with the disease. We need to be careful. Alright. Well, guys. Yeah, I think it's a good time and place to end it, right? Yeah. I did a little bit. This game, it's enjoyable. I like the way the plot's developing. And I want to see more. So thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you in the next episode.